today, as Pastor Matt said, we do kick off a brand new series. I'm stoked about it because everyone who's a follower of Jesus has some kind of turning point story. They may not all sound the same, and indeed they won't, but everyone has some story of how God entered and worked in their lives and began to change them from the inside out. Sometimes that's dramatic. And some of the stories we look at in John's gospel are gonna be a bit dramatic. I, I would put the woman at the well in Samaria in that category, maybe Nicodemus. But at other times, it's not quite so sudden and obvious. I would put Simon Peter in that category where God's work was much more methodical and slow. It was sort of three steps forward, two steps back. But here's the thing. If we're on that journey with Jesus, his work in us is never done. It is never completed, but the work he started, he's going to carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. One of the lessons, though, that I would like for us to learn in this series early and hopefully be reminded of often is that when it comes to God's work in your life, don't expect it to look the same as your friend, your parents, your, your spouse, your coworkers. See, God's not into making clones of us. He's not into cookie cutters. So let's just get rid of the molds right up front. Molds are for moldy people, okay? Let's get rid of the molds and let's celebrate God's awesome creativity as he works in every individual's life a bit differently. But with that understood, let's also acknowledge that there are some patterns we're gonna see. And one of those patterns is that almost always, God uses people as catalysts in our lives. He uses people strategically, and Andrew is one of those catalytic people. He's really one of the unsung heroes in the Bible. We know very little about him. He doesn't even show up a lot in Scripture, but wow, did his life have impact. And so I want us to look today at three things about Andrew's lives that I, life that I believe are kind of instructive for our lives. And I would say that no matter where you are on the journey, some listening right now are kind of kicking the tires, window shopping Christianity. You wonder, could this be for me? What is this all about? I commend you. I think there's many things you can glean. But others of you are veterans, and you too are going to find things to challenge and encourage you in this series and in today's message. So let's jump in. The first thing I want you to see about Andrew is that he left John the Baptist. He leaves John the Baptist. Now please know, whenever we start a journey with Jesus, you can be sure it's going to involve leaving some things behind, whether it's an old mindset, an old worldview, whether it's certain habits or practices. Occasionally, it will involve certain relationships that are toxic and pulling us down where God will say, listen, I, I, I need you to get a different environment here. But there always are things we leave behind. And in Andrew's case, he had been a sincere seeker of the kingdom of God, and he had been listening to a man named John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was an awesome leader and a great person, and he was preaching that, listen, someone is coming. Get ready. It's going to happen any moment now. This is not about me, he would say. It's about this Messiah that's coming, the Lamb of God. He is so awesome, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. That was his message day after day after day. And one day, Jesus showed up on the scene. I start reading in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, some of your translations may say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me 
because he was before me. Wow, does that sound confusing or what? In John's gospel, words are never wasted. And what we're gonna learn in this series is that often, not only are words not wasted, but they often have levels, different levels of meaning. And here, he's referring to the fact, as Jesus later said, before Abraham was, I am. He's referring here to the eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Wow. Now, who is this guy, John, who's saying all these things? I'll tell you, he was a very impressive leader. Jesus would later say of him, as recorded in Matthew 11, verse 11, this is, this is quite a statement, of all those born of women, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. Wow, that is quite a commendation coming from the lips of Jesus. There's many reasons he was impressive, but two reasons John was so impressive is that he knew who he was and he knew what his mission was on this earth. Can I just tell you something, folks? It is a great day in any of our lives when we truly know who we are we're no longer pretending or playing at life. We're no longer trying to just, you know, shape our image and fake people out. We know who we are, and we're comfortable with that. We're at peace with that. And we know why we're here. We know what God wants us to do while we're on the planet. That is a great day in our lives. And this is where John the Baptist was stellar. He knew exactly who he was. He was comfortable with that. And he knew why God had called him. And he said, look, I'm pointing you to Jesus. I can call you to repentance, but I can't change your lives. I can baptize you in water, but he and he alone can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. That was John's whole mission. We pick it up again in verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now, that word translated look or behold doesn't mean just a passing glance. John is encouraging them, keep your eyes on this man. Focus on him. Don't take your eyes off of him. And then in verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Now, I got a question for you. If you're John the Baptist and your congregation is now shrinking, because that's what was happening, you're losing followers, all right? You're no longer trending on social media, and you see faithful followers who've been following you now going to follow this Messiah, Jesus, how would you feel? You know what I think? I think John was delighted. Again, because he knew who he was and he knew what his mission was. This meant success for John. That was his whole goal, to point people to Jesus. And by the way, that is a huge part of our task as well. Now, in this series, we're gonna listen probably just about every week to a different turning point testimony or story. Some of them will be a little longer than others. Some will be fairly short and pithy. But they're all stories from people within our church family about how God brought a turning point 
in their lives. I invite you now to look at the screens and let's listen together to this turning point story. I would describe uh, my upbringing as a great one. Um, I grew up in a really strong family, full of integrity. It was great, um, but always within a ministry context. I really didn't know a life outside of ministry. Um, and so the, the deeper questions of life, like who is this Jesus that we hear about? Uh, what is the church? What is the role of the church? All of those things, I really needed to confront them head on. Um, in 2007, I had hit a point that I would describe as maybe my lowest point. I was incredibly overwhelmed internally. I did not know what I believed. I felt a little bit disillusioned with this whole faith thing, with um, the church even a little bit. And I didn't know where I stood on it, but I very much have a sense of, you know, this is on me. I recognize that this is an individual thing that I need to figure out. Um, so very much felt a sense of responsibility with that, a sense of feeling lost. Um, so all of those deeper questions, I don't think people would have known externally that I was going through them. I hit it very well. The way that that manifested itself was in anorexia. I had an eating disorder that I struggled with for about two years. And I think for me, yes, it had physical ramifications for sure, but primarily it was a mental and emotional struggle where maybe I didn't have control over these bigger topics of life, my belief system, um, what I thought about the ministry context that I was growing up in. I, didn't, I just didn't know what I believed, but at least I had control over this one thing. I knew that I had control over this one area of my life, and at that time in my life, I felt I needed that control. I was at my lowest weight ever in 2007. Um, I actually had gone three days at one point and had only eaten a tomato. It was just a deep sense of I needed control over this, and this is what I can control right now. In August of 2007, went to a festival, random outdoor, super fun festival. We were camping out in tents, and it hit me one of the nights, you need to go to a Casting Crowns concert. During that concert, I had what I can only describe as a out-of-body supernatural experience. I, I heard the audible voice of Jesus Christ, and it was an instantaneous moment for me, a, a turning point that literally was within a matter of seconds where I heard, I am this Jesus that you have been hearing about. This is real. You are my daughter, and I am the foundation upon which you can feel solid. I am the foundation upon which you can build your life. My eating disorder was healed, and from that night, I immediately began to put back on the weight that I had previously lost and had started to um, instill a lot more healthy physical and mental habits. Um, I was immediately filled with a sense of peace and stability that I just never had before. Um, and that has lasted, thank God, since that day. My day-to-day -day doesn't look that different, but my internal reality is a 180 degree turn. My motives, why I do things, um, my convictions, the ultimate sense of hope that I have in the future and why I'm doing what I'm doing, worlds apart from what my reality was before. I ultimately know that no matter how much life stinks or how great life is, my purpose for being here doesn't change. This is a temporary space where I am on a mission to win other souls for Christ and to make the most of what God has given me on this earth to be a good steward of what I have now, because ultimately, 
forever, eternally, I'm gonna be with Jesus Christ somewhere else. And that just gives me a completely different perspective on how I live my day today. So that's my turning point story. All right. You know, one of the things we learn is that there's no such thing as second-generation Christians. Did you know that? You may say, well, my parents were, or my cousins are, or my teacher, or my friends. We cannot come to God just on the coattails of someone else. There comes a moment in life that no matter how many people in our lives are saying, there's the lamb, look at him, He's the Savior. We still have to come to grips with that on our own because all of us will stand before God on our own and give an account for what we've done with Jesus Christ. So here's John the Baptist pointing people to Jesus and Andrew gets the message and he leaves John the Baptist. Nothing wrong with John the Baptist. He was doing his job right, but it was time now for a turning point. The second thing I want you to see is that he not only leaves John the Baptist, but he learns from Jesus. He learns from Jesus. I'm reading now in verse 37. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Now, this may sound so simple to you, but at its very core, a disciple is a learner. That's literally what it means. To be a disciple of Jesus is one who is in school with him, as it were. You're literally learning more and more of who he is, what he taught, how he wants you to live, how he designed you to be in this world. As Peter puts it later in the book we call Second Peter in the Bible, we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let me just pause there and ask you a question. Personal, real personal here. Are you a learner? Are you a learner? Are you really learning more of who Jesus is? Are you growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I apologize for sounding preachy here if it does, but I just gotta put it to you straight. If you're not a learner, I wonder if you're a disciple. If you're not really learning, if you're not somehow on a growth curve, some kind of trajectory of going deeper with him, we have to stop and ask the question, did I ever have a turning point? Did I ever follow Jesus Christ in my life? But I'm struck here by the question that Jesus asked. I think it's one we need to ask ourselves. Jesus said, what do you want? Now, don't you wish we knew his tone? I don't think Jesus was mean here. I don't think he was crotchety going, what do you guys want? Get out of here. That's not his tone. But I wish we knew exactly the tone. I think it was loving, I think it was kind and encouraging, interrogative. What do you want? And you know, that's a common question that he asked of people throughout the Gospels. For instance, James and John, as recorded in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, they came to him and he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? Provocative question. There's a blind man just a few verses later named Bartimaeus in Jericho. And he comes along and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? You may go, well, isn't the answer obvious? But maybe not. Maybe he just wants a handout, some money, some food. That's what people were probably giving him as he sat by the roadside and begged. Or maybe he wanted a warmer jacket or maybe he wanted a softer cushion to, to make his sitting there by the roadside a little more comfortable. People ask for very, very secondary things, but he said, Lord, I want to see, and Jesus met his need. One other example, in Matthew 20, it says, the mother of Zebedee's sons, and I put it that way because that's exactly the way the text puts it. The mother of Zebedee's sons comes to Jesus with a request for her boys, 
And before she can ask it, Jesus asks her, what do you want me to do for you? What is it you want here? And now he says that same thing to Andrew. What do you want? I think it's a profound question. Hey, how would you answer it? You're here today. You've made this effort. I would say that 90-something percent of you would be professing followers of Jesus Christ as far as I can tell. But I want to ask you, what are you really looking for in this? What do you think the end game, the goal of all this is? What do you want Christ to do for you? Are you looking for the forgiveness of sins so that you know that heaven will be your destiny? That's valid, but is that all you want? Are you looking for your conscience to be eased or maybe guilt to be gone? You say, well, wow, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. I just want to be sure that those are dealt with and forgiven so that I can have an easy conscience and be rid of this guilt once and for all. Well, again, that's valid. But is that where it stops? I think every disciple needs to pause a moment and go, what am I really looking for? Because I will tell you this upon promise today, God has a lot more in mind for you than you probably ever imagined. We usually want to settle for something that's kind of small and shriveled, something kind of pathetic compared to what he has in mind for us. I believe he has something that if you really knew it, it would so, be so immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine. I believe in some cases it would literally blow your mind. Well, Andrew's answer is provocative. He says, where are you staying? Now, at first that sounds like an utter disconnect. You go, Andrew, snap to it, man. What are you thinking? That doesn't make sense with what's just happened. Jesus just asked, what do you want? And you ask, where are you staying? But again, words in John's gospel are never wasted. Perhaps he's asking, Lord, where do you, where do you hang out? In what environments do you feel comfortable? Lord, uh, where do you make your home? And the answer to that is ultimately, in people. As Paul would later write, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You see, one of the most radical transformations of this new covenant that we're all a part of if we're followers of Jesus is that God, as the book of Acts declares, no longer lives in temples made by human hands. We thank God for this building and all of our facilities. But this, I hope you understand, is not some temple of God where God kind of hangs out here and lives here. Do you know that? Do you understand that? Please, I hope you do. Honestly, other than the fact that we're accustomed to gathering here, there's really nothing more special about this building than any other building. It's just brick and mortar. It's just stuff that buildings are made of. Please get the message. No longer are buildings like this the temple of God. It's now you who are the temple of God. And as Peter, Simon Peter, would later declare on the day of Pentecost, Andrew's brother, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And do you remember what he promised would happen? You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So please understand that God has more in mind for us than we probably ever imagined. He doesn't want to just forgive sins and give a home in heaven and ease our conscience and take away our guilt and give us a little more peace day by day. He actually wants you to become his living ambassador as he lives in you day by day, moment by moment. Can you wrap your brain around that, folks? That's a mind blower. You take, hey, listen, listen. You take him with you everywhere you go. You don't leave him behind when you leave the building here. That's good New Testament theology. So where are you staying? 
Jesus' answer is, I'm staying with you. I'm hanging out in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ, Romans 8, 9 says. So if you're a follower of Jesus today, you are his dwelling place. But there's a third and final observation I want you to consider. Andrew leaves John the Baptist. He starts learning from Jesus because that's what disciples do. They're learners. If you're not learning of Jesus, you have to wonder if he's really your leader and your Lord. But third, he leads his brother Simon to Christ. He leads his brother Simon to Christ. Now, last Sunday, there was a tragic accident where nine people died in a helicopter accident. And all week long, we've been seeing the news reports and the wonderful and appropriate tributes to those nine victims who died in the crash, including the basketball icon Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest basketball players who's ever lived, and his daughter Gianna. I mean, just this last Friday, at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, just before the Lakers Trailblazers game, there was a marvelous tribute. And Usher sang an incredible rendition of Amazing Grace. And there was moving cello music as a video with Kobe's own words recorded throughout the years. And then appropriately, LeBron James gave a brief speech at the end of that time, all before they played the game. And it's been incredible to see the outpouring of emotion and I think, very appropriate appreciation for this life of tremendous influence. And so we've been reminded of that. This, By the way, I hope you will continue in your prayers to remember the victims of all those families, uh, the the, uh, families who've been impacted by this unspeakable loss. I hope you will continue to pray. But can I tell you something today? You don't have to be a superstar athlete a rock star in the culture, an incredibly successful person in the eyes of the world to have an enormous impact. And that's what we really see in Andrew's life. Would you believe me if I told you this guy, this guy we're talking about today is one of the most impactful people in all of history, even though he's just mentioned a handful of times in the Bible, and even though most people have never even heard of him. I read now in verse 41. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and catch these words, and he brought him to Jesus. You say, Pastor Rex, you said Andrew is an impactful, influential person. Yes, I did. You know why? Because his example, not only of bringing his brother physically to Jesus, which we can no longer do, by the way. We can't physically bring people to the physical Jesus. But his example has inspired millions of Christians for 2,000 years now to basically do the same. As some of you know, I spent a number of years of my life working with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and I, I look back fondly on those years. God was moving so powerfully through that ministry that we literally saw hundreds of thousands of people just in the years I was with the team come to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's no exaggeration. Hundreds of thousands. Incredible. And people look at that and go, what's the secret? Well, I'm gonna tell you the secret today. And any gnarly veteran of the team, if they were standing here today, would absolutely affirm what I am about to say. People think, is it just Billy's, was it just his charisma? Was it just the fact that there were a lot of financial support? Was it just the fact they put billboards up and did advertising? No, no, no. In 1954, they were in London in Herringay Arena, one of those classic Billy Graham meetings. And there was a church in London that was the fastest growing church in London at the time. It was a Brethren Assembly And the pastor was Reverend Bob Pettifer. That was his name, Reverend Bob Pettifer. He was teaching the people of this Brethren Assembly Church to do exactly what Andrew did in our story today. What did he do? He met Jesus, 
And then he looked around him and said, wow, I wonder who else I could bring to Jesus. He went after his brother Simon and brought him to Jesus. And so what they did, they called it Operation Andrew in the church. He issued these cards for his people and they wrote down names, usually seven to 10 names, of people that as far as they knew did not have a vital saving relationship with Jesus Christ. They began to pray for them and they began to reach out and get involved in positive ways in their lives. And wow, were people coming to Christ. That church was growing so fast just because the, the Christian life was infectious to them. They wanted to share it just like Andrew. And so the Billy Graham team saw this and up to that time, folks, if you had 100 people responding at invitation time out of a vast arena, that was considered awesome and wonderful. And indeed it was. But the team said, I wonder if this would work anywhere. And so the next year, they had a chance to try it. They were in Scotland the next year, 55. And months before the big arena event, they issued Operation Andrew cards to all the Christians in the region who were involved and said, look, would you identify the names of people and begin to pray for them and reach out and build bridges of friendship if you don't already know them well? And that's what the Christians did. And the result was staggering. The response went up tenfold. And all the old veterans would tell you the key to a Billy Graham effort was Operation Andrew. It wasn't mass evangelism. It was individual evangelism on a mass scale because 80 to 90% of those who responded to Jesus Christ had been personally prayed for and in most cases literally brought to the meeting by someone who cared about them. Wow. That's why I say Andrew is an unsung hero as he's inspired millions of Christians to do exactly what he did. Amazing. He just got this crazy idea that since I met Jesus, I'm just gonna spend the rest of my life bringing people to Jesus, and that's what he did. Read the Gospels. In today's passage, he brought his brother Simon. You go on to chapter six of John. There's a little boy with five loaves and two fish. The people are hungry. Who brings him to Jesus? Read it. Andrew. Andrew was always connecting people with Jesus. He apparently got up every day and said, Lord, who would, you, who would you want to put in my life today that I could help bring to Jesus Christ? You read on, John chapter 12. There's a group of Greeks who show up and they say to Aunt Philip, sir, we would like to see Jesus. What does Philip do? He goes to Andrew. Andrew is the one who brings people to Jesus. And then Philip and Andrew together bring this group of people to Jesus Christ. As I close today, people sometimes ask me, what's your vision, pastor? What's your vision? What kind of church do you want? Do you want a bunch of really slick programs and super duper newfangled things in the church that are really look cool and impressive? Nothing wrong with programs. But in my heart of hearts, what I really want, I just want a church full of Andrews. A church full of Andreas. A church full of little Andes. Men and women and children who've met Jesus Christ, they've had their own turning point, and then they spend their lives understanding that God is living in them. They are now his temple. And one of the key reasons God has left them on the planet is to help be a connector. You say, well, pastor, I don't have the gift of evangelism. You don't have to. I doubt if Andrew did. But he could sure help bring people to Jesus. His life was so winsome. He was a great conversationalist, apparently. He was someone that was so approachable, and his life was so positive and distinctive that people caught a sense, here's a person who is positively different, and he helped lead them to Jesus Christ.
Oh, I pray that we would be a people like that. I want to spend the rest of my days helping introduce people to Jesus like Andrew did, and then just helping them get better acquainted. Father, I ask that you would make us that kind of people. Thank you for the inspiring example of Andrew. It is staggering the ripple effect his life had. Just in bringing his brother Simon alone, that alone has sent shockwaves around the world. Help us to understand that you've got people out there, people you died for, people you love, Lord, and you want to use us as catalysts in their lives. Wow, what an exciting thought. Don't let it be lost on us today, Father. Let us start thinking. Let the wheels start turning. Who in my life might you want me to help bring to Jesus? Father, I thank you for all the lives that are gonna be changed and transformed because you allowed us to be Andrew-like people and bring others to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We pray in his name. Amen.